Musicians getting wine and water, and where are you guys? I am in Toronto, you know. At home? And at yeah. Home. Yes, at home, yep. I'm at home as well. We're in different homes, um, but we are together in spirit. So, what's new? Yeah, so our music, um, and I know Charlotte can speak to this as well, I feel like has changed throughout COVID. Um, we signed our record deal in 2018. A lot of the songs were pre-written from previous years and we recorded it in 2019 and then released it in 2020 during COVID. Um, and I think a lot of the emotions that we were feeling um, with health and you know all these other aspects of COVID that people are struggling with. Um, our latest release, Rain on My Parade, I feel like touched on that kind of emotion that we were going through. And I, I think we're going to continue on kind of that lane for the next little bit. Um, but yeah, that, that would be the latest release. Yeah. The latest release. And you've been releasing singles. It's kind of a strategy of yours, I suppose. Just being able to put them out because we can't tour is uh, an honor. We definitely have um, um, an EP that we're going to release um, soon. And then we're going to work on, um, uh, I guess it would be technically first, is it first full length album? We are working on more projects um, that we want to release. So that's all in the works. But right now, yeah, it's pretty much singles, just kind of throwing them out there one, one at a time. Yeah, I think Low Profile was the first song that we had really actually properly kind of released um, and put out there um, right before, literally right before we got signed. Um, so yeah you even do christmas songs it was so funny because you know i was talking to my mom and she was like charlotte you should write a christmas song and i was like mom you're crazy that's not gonna happen <laughs> it's it so suits you it's just like i'm not gonna you know what i mean i was like what am i gonna write about a uh, holly and jolly and whatnot you know it's just not me right and yeah. um, even though i love christmas and um so then i went to my bathroom and i you know i like to write songs in the bathroom because the echo it's just perfect this okay. song just kind of just came out of me just like just the way it was and I was like whoa this is pretty cool it's kind of a Christmas song but it's kind of not it's kind of like more of like I guess a love song you know wink wink um but like <laughs> you know I was like this is cool so then yeah I showed it to our team and the label and they really loved it and I actually finished it in July which is interesting because it's not really Christmassy time but that's when I finished it and then we released it. And this song was just so fun. It was kind of like, I feel like a darker side of our music that I really yeah. like and I definitely, like sonically, and I definitely want to play with that sound more. Oh, great. And so, okay, so go back again, uh, chronologically one more step. Okay, so I'll touch on this one because this one kind of has a funny story. Feel good. So, Feel Good kind of came as a surprise. It's definitely more pop sonically than the other songs and there's a reason for that. Um, we had the opportunity to attend some Grammy after parties with our label in 20... 20... 2019 and 2020, right before the pandemic. Before yeah. like COVID 2020, like pre-COVID 2020, which was like January when nobody really knew the full force of what was going to go down. Yeah. And so, yeah, we were there like in packed rooms, bumping into people, shaking hands, you know, like stuff that doesn't exist nowadays. And um, <laughs> it had fit us into the studio at 10 a.m. Uh, the next day um, and keep in mind we were probably up until like 7 a.m. Toronto time at these events because of the time zone change that yeah. really goes a long way <laughs> and so we'd gone in that day and I was horribly sick um, I had the worst cold flu ever and um charlotte had written this song and it was uh, originally for sync was like the, the concept of it and um anyway recorded that song that morning on like little to no sleep i was like sicker than a dog so charlotte had to like add some extra vocals and i tried to add ad libs you know even though i was really congested and um a year later we found out it got synced for this major american commercial um, which probably would have been like the highlight of her career. 
and then found out the day of that it got pulled for something else. Um, so that sucks. Oh. <laughs> and that was the only reason why we were releasing the song was because this commercial was a part of the release. Um, and it ended up getting picked up by the WWE later, which is also very cool. And we're very honored yeah. that it was featured in that. But that other commercial that it was going to be a part of was a really big deal. Um, yeah. So that was that release. But I, I know Life is of... full of disappointments. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, fine, you know. Um, so that, that's talking. I don't remember about that. That's song. hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> So oh, you guys are funny. Song. Like, they're like, this song sounds nothing like your other songs, and I couldn't really technically say why, like, it didn't work out, but, um, yeah. You are, you are getting a lot of media coverage. I mean, I was tuning into ET or something like that, one of those CTV entertainment shows, and there you were with your homemade video. Oh, wow. yeah, that was that cool. That's cool. Yeah, no, it's been great. We've got, we've gotten a lot of um, really cool sort of media coverage and opportunities since we've been releasing. Um, and it's always nice, you know, it's really cool that, you know, they're supportive and whatnot. Like we have friends in Alberta um, who will like message us and be like, yo, I saw you playing, lately it's been a lot of gyms, um, gyms or in like restaurants and stuff. And so we'll get messages from people who are like, okay, sorry that we're like taking over your dinner here you know across oh, the country oh don't be sorry it's awesome cool. no it's cool it's kind really of proud cool. feeling i don't know why i feel like a big brother but i'm probably your, old enough to be your mom's big brother so no. <laughs> oh, my mom and dad, actually my parents had us at an not an older age but i guess for their generation because a lot of people their generation had younger um they like had kids at a younger age i think my mom was like 35 or 36 when she had us Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Well, my son's 25, so. Okay, cool. So your okay. son would be my sister's age. Oh, yeah. cool. All right. Okay, so what, enough about that. I feel old on, already. <laughs> Let's get into some of the, since we're talking about like age and parents and stuff like that, some yeah. of the mentorship that's happened in your career. Um, yeah, so I mean, when I look back at like our history growing up, we were very, very lucky where our parents were very supportive and we there was a certain age when we stopped going on like vacations as a family and we would our vacations were usually around something to do with music so if there was a gig opportunity in nashville we'd go vacation in nashville and we'd go like play here and meet somebody here and so our parents were very supportive that way and um, when i look back at some of the opportunities we had probably a few highlights were um being able to play john lennon's official birthday with Yoko Ono that you brought up or we did like a few tributes at the NAMM show a um, couple notable ones were probably like Shaka Khan, Sheila E um, got to perform for Garbage and Steve Vai and like artists that we really look up to and this was all stuff pre our record deal um, and to me it really teaches me a lot about um, the power of live show and connecting with people in person, um, the opportunities we had just because we were able to play in front of people. Um, and I'll never forget that. And I really hope one day with COVID, you know, things open up again, because some of oh, our yeah. most important memories <laughs> were like pre-2018 when we were just playing shows. So usually I ask bands, you know, usually they're smaller bands and I ask them, you know, where's been your favorite place to play? And for you, obviously, it's a tougher choice. Uh, New York, maybe. Is, was that at uh, Central Park? All these people came to Central Park and made a big peace sign. It sounds a human crazy. peace you can sign, that's great. Peace sign, yeah. And so, yeah, we were singing in Central Park right before I think everybody formed the uh, peace sign. And so, yeah, it was oh, really so amazing. Cool. It was a beautiful day. Um, so it was very, very fun. I love Central Park. It's so beautiful. So it was really cool. So that must be one of your favorites. Yeah, that one was yeah. really special. Um, I'll never forget, like, we actually had the opportunity to perform in China and Shanghai. And this was a, a few years ago now. That was 20... What year was that, Charlotte? 20... Uh, <laughs> it's amazing how long your career is already. Yeah, God, 13, I, 13, it makes 14, me sound old now. 
<laughs> I know. Uh, Which game are you talking about? About? We had the uh, opportunity. Dang, like 2014, October 2014. Again, so I always tell this story to my musician friends, and I'll sum it up really quickly. Um, we were playing when we were very young at a golf course gig, and it was in Spruce Grove, Alberta, um, kind of a com rural community outside of Edmonton. Not so much rural anymore. At the time, it was quite a bit smaller. And um, it, the gig didn't pay, I can't remember. I, I remember being kind of like, oh, we had to play for like four hours and the sound system wasn't good. And nobody was listening and we didn't make a lot of money off of it. And even though I was a young kid, I was still used to like, well, if you play for four hours, typically there's like some sort of reward of some sort. And should be extra. Yeah. And um, I remember my parents saying, well, it's a really great opportunity. There's gonna be cool people there. So like, you should just, you know, take it by the horns and do it. So long story short, we did it. We felt like nobody was listening. It was a very long time. And one of the guys that was at the golf course show um, was an MLA. He later, I think, became the finance minister. Um, and anyway, he was the one that invited us to meet William and Kate in 2013 when they came to Calgary um, because he was able to bring a couple youth to come with him. And then that was also a, one of the reasons why we got the Shanghai gig. So for me, that so really like, shows me like, wow, like take every opportunity you can because you really never know. Um, so that was kind of like a launch point. Yeah, yeah, really was a, yeah, you know, especially nowadays, like a lot of people, there's like a lot of artists that are like on labels or indie or indie artists, you know, and there's so many incredible opportunities out there that could just come out of anything. Um, That's great. Oh, yeah. I mean, mentorship is, is everything when you really get people who, we've had people that, you know, they, they weren't obligated to um, to be a mentor or even just give kind words or even talk to us because these people are very you know successful that we've uh, sort of crossed paths with over the years um, but they were so nice which is just says so much about them as as a person I think the first my memory I it's hard to go back and remember all all of them but like I think the first one I really sticks in my head is um uh Sheila E you know the the drummer for yeah. Prince drum right. prince of course she is i mean she's just incredible so she was playing at nam in 2014 uh january 2014 we went down uh, we won the john lennon songwriting contest we got to the prize was to play at nam and then also we performed at the she rocks awards it was the very first she rocks awards that we had ever performed at when it was in the little ballroom and um sheila e was there being honored and it was just so crazy. It was this little ballroom. We were playing at the beginning and then she let you was being honored. And, um, and she came up to us and our mom after and was saying, oh, you know, you guys are, are very talented, blah, blah, blah. So nice of her. Cause like I said, not obligated. She's like, mm -hmm. she's, you know, who she is. And it was very just cool. that was the first one. I was like, this is just super special. The first, oh, actually I will say I'm talking a lot now. The first mentor for me was David Malloy. He is um, a songwriter who wrote a lot of songs for Reba and oh. uh, and Kenny Chesney. Uh, uh, yeah, cool. and just a lot of like legends of country music back in the day. His father, uh, David's father, recorded Elvis. Um, so we met David in Nashville, actually almost 10 years to the day now, March, 2011. And he took, kind of took us under his wing and um, was very encouraging for me as a songwriter because he's written, I think, written slash produced 41 number one hits in his career. So he wow. really, like, we years going out of Nashville and, and he was recording us and he was just definitely the first mentor in terms of, like, songwriting for me. So that was really, um, yeah, I think the first one, really. Um, as far as mentors go, I think the first one that I can really think of was a lady named Dinah Gretsch who uh, saw us perform at NAMM, so same circle, NAMM show, we got to perform, and uh, Dinah actually owns Gretsch guitars with her husband Fred, and um, just before we got our record deal, kind of at a point where I was feeling very discouraged with music, and I'll never forget that. I owe her a lot for what she's done for us. Um, for 
people that have inspired me. And I always say this, um, Orianthi, who some people know her, some people don't, if you're not so much in like the guitar world, but she's like a shredder. So she was on the Michael Jackson tour uh, just before he died that didn't uh, get to the chance to um, hit the road. And uh, I remember like when I was younger and I wanted to learn how to solo and I was just very discouraged because I had like a guitar teacher that kind of said, oh, you know, women don't typically solo. And I wanted to learn how to solo and he wouldn't teach me. And I, it's just, you know, it's just those like stereotypes. And even to this day, I still kick myself in the butt where I'm like, oh, I don't know as much as this guy, or I'm not as technically inclined as this guy. And I I let that get to like my, um, my uh, confidence a little bit, but the way she holds herself and the way she like wears heels on stage and shreds um, inspired me since I was a kid. I remember being in like movie theater when I was like nine watching it. And then I actually got to uh, share the stage with her at one NAMM show. We got to play, I played acoustic guitar while she was soloing in the band. And that was like a weird (laughs) highlight for me. So like we're on on Instagram with each other now. She comments occasionally. I try to comment the most on hers because I mean, I don't know if I'll ever get the chance to tell her one day how much she means to me as a player. Um, But hopefully that'd be cool. Oh, that's great. That's a good story. And, you know, we, I think we may have cut Charlotte off there, but there's two other segues now that, that have uh, popped up. And one is She Rocks and the other is your guitar um, endorsement, which is not the one that you just mentioned. So do you want to mention your guitar endorsement? Cause you just mentioned the other guys. Yeah, go for it, Char. Yeah, so we are, um, we actually, the year that we went down to the first She Rocks Awards, we met um, Chris Martin of Martin Guitars, um, who was, getting a taco outside at the uh, the NAM right by the main stage where we were performing. He was getting a taco like right by the main stage and he saw us and he was like, oh, those two girls are playing Martin guitars, both of them, that's cool. So then he, yeah, we just, we've cultivated this relationship with Martin and they've been really amazing. They've been supporters since day one, which is very yeah. awesome of them. <laughs> we love that's them, great. I mean, we love Martin guitars and they've just been so supportive over the years. Um, we went to their, um, factory um in nazareth outside of new york and uh yeah it was really special there they've been awesome we've also worked with uh, prs guitars um sarah owns a beautiful starla uh guitar beautiful oh there oh yeah that's that that was a custom you custom yeah uh so yeah that's been amazing um yeah we love uh, uh, yeah. Behind me. I want an autographed version for the Hall of Fame that I'm making. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if we ever get the Hall of Fame. Yeah, you're getting there. Know. We've smashed a couple guitars in our lives, but I'll make sure not to smash that one. I like That's that. That's cool. <laughs> and so you've been working really hard. And I know that from from even just, you know, community sort of jams and things like that. So tell us about your, your motivations and, in, in, you know, just your day-to-day music. Yeah, I think like um, as an, a musician, I mean, we know firsthand what it's like when you're indie, but you're getting shows, you know, probably from the outside perspective, people are like, oh, wow, they're so successful. But then as the artist, you're like, wow, I wish I had a record deal. And then you get a record deal and you're like, people are like, oh, wow, you have like 100,000 streams on this song and you're signed to this record label, like life must be perfect. And then you have 100,000 streams and you're like, oh, but I don't have like a top 10 charting single at radio. <laughs> and so you're always gonna feel inadequate for more. to the people around you or that next step. Um, And I think COVID, especially now, I think a lot of musicians can relate to the feeling of being like isolated and out of control of your career because uh, live music and performing and touring, which was one of the biggest ways of music promotion is basically non-existent. Um, So I know for us, like as far as um, staying motivated and stuff, like I think Shaul and I always go back to our roots. Like the fact that you brought up our past and the childhood memories we've had 
those moments and those mentors are actually key reasons why we continue to want to pursue this crazy mm -hmm. passion. Um, cause without those mentors or those special moments, like, I mean, it's hard, like it's not an easy time for music. It's very discouraging. And even for people like us that like indie musicians may say, oh, they're on a record label, but you know, nothing's guaranteed. It's not an easy time. Um, so yeah, I definitely like realizing, okay, why do you love to do this? And the people that believe in you. Um, yeah. What do you think, Shar? Yeah. You said it all now. No, 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 no. You said <laughs> it all. Yeah. No, you said it all. Um, I agree. Actually, did we skim over She Rocks? Because I'd like to go back to that. I right. Think, yeah. um, um, I feel like, yeah, I don't remember talking about that. So, yeah. So why don't you give us the lowdown on She Rocks and where you may be going with it? Yeah. yeah. Sarah, do you, I mean, I can take this one too. It's up to you. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> Is it six She Rocks now? Wow. I think, I think it's six over the years. Uh, we skipped one year or, or something, but we've been, yeah, pretty much since, almost since the beginning, we've been going to them. I mean, just the show itself and then everything they, they stand for, you know, just promoting badass women in music. It's been really amazing. And just the people that we've been able to meet, Sheila E was one example. Yeah, so um, the She Rocks Awards is actually run by an organization called the Women's International Music Network. And that was formed by a lady named Laura B. Whitmore, who lives just outside of New York, um, but had a lot of connections in LA. And she actually worked at Guitar World for many years. She was a female writer at Guitar World. And that's kind of how she got like her um a lot of like the connections and like the shredding world and musicians and women in music and we performed at one of the first um it wasn't the first she rocks but i i can't remember what year it was it might have been the second or third yeah something like that something like that and yeah. um it was in a, a small room probably 20 or 30 people maybe wow. less and sheila e was one of the people a part of it and we performed last minute. She asked us like the day before, cause she saw us performing. If we would, you know, play three songs like during the reception while people were getting food. And we jumped on the opportunity, not really knowing much about it or what would happen. And that started like an incredible relationship. Since then, the award show has grown to, it was originally in the convention center at NAM, and then it graduated to the House of Blues Anaheim. And right. since then they've awarded people like uh, Shirley Manson from Garbage, the B-52, Shaka Khan, just incredible female musicians and icons. And um, Laura actually um, invited me to intern at her uh, company um, to help spread the word about She Rocks. And with that, I got to meet a lot of incredible women in business and women in music. And it's been an integral part of our career. Um, so yeah, we learned a lot about the industry and that was all pre-record deal, pre- Yeah. All that stuff, yeah. Maybe. Great, I'm glad we went back to that. Yeah. Um, okay, so I have a question. Oh, I'm on, I'm on low battery. Okay, yeah. I have a question which I ask everybody. It's a question that I stole from the movie Woodstock. So this is from the Ooh. 60s. And some British guy is there. I don't know how he got there because everybody else around him was all muddy. And this British guy with an umbrella and a, a tie and his, his loafers on asked a, a really great question. And, and all the people around, I guess they weren't on whatever brown acid or whatever it was, but yeah. everybody <laughs> around him answered it really articulately. And I was just so impressed. I wanted to ask everybody from now on. And so for the past year or so, I've been asking this question, why is music the great communicator? Wow. Oh. That's a deep one. That's a deep one. Wow. <laughs> I feel like you need to be on. That's why we're able I feel to like I need to be on. Oh, sorry, what's there? I was saying the same thing. Maybe I need to be on uh, some sort of hallucinogenic to answer that. <laughs> yes, I think I need to be on something to answer this one. Damn. Okay. White wine won't cut uh, it enough, guys. That, that's that's a wine. question. Spritzers. 
Don't do the brown is... spritzers. Oh. <laughs> me. Go for it, Char. Why is music the great communicator? To you, anyways. To me, I mean, I, I feel like music is, I'm not trying to be deep at all here, so don't judge it me. It is deep. <laughs> Uh, already, yeah, already, you can tell. Um, I feel like music is hardwired into humans and just how we work. Um, it just like the way it sounds, the way it makes us feel, it's simply, it's in human nature. I mean, you see babies just immediately dance to music, right? And I feel like music, when you're a writer of music, you know, it invokes, like you can, you can know nothing about poetry. And yet if you're a songwriter, you're a songwriter, you don't even, in a way, if you even aren't a writer, like you're a writer, but it just, the music, I feel like I invokes. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, in, in, yeah. It's an music interesting to, way to put it. Okay, it brings out something in us and it connects on another level right. just because, right. yeah, it's it's spiritual. Music is just spiritual. I mean, that's, we already know that. I don't know how else to say it. It transforms it's just, you. That's well, what I it, think, it sounds like. Yeah. I think like especially because I mean people that aren't in the music industry that don't do it for a living you know um what what are some key parts of their life you know it's relationships it's um friendships family dating um their struggles mental health um a lot of the struggles we face day-to-day -day life is communication like if you think about it communication is like the sole way of connecting and and you know relating and healing and i i'm just realizing i'm probably not as creating as good as a answer as these people on this no that that's you guys are doing great <laughs> but it'll never fail that like if i'm not feeling heard in my life or i feel alone in something and i find a song that says exactly how i feel for some reason that one little three minute 26 second song is mm -hmm. could be the one thing to like make me feel like everything's okay because somebody who yeah. wrote that yeah. understands me so as a part yeah. of every relationship that you have and every part of your life really it does it, it definitely um it affects us more than we even realize um mm -hmm. which is you know it's it's a powerful thing for sure that's great you know, i don't know like, we yeah, grew up it, in like a pretty small um smaller town compared to Toronto and yeah. you know like pursuing music in a smaller town is kind of frowned upon it's kind of like well what are you doing like that's not a real job and I remember being like younger and feeling discouraged and like I didn't really fit in like I couldn't and I don't mean to say that in the most cliche way possible but I think a lot of like musicians and artists that grow up in like smaller towns can kind of relate to that like not really know what to do with yourself or um you know how to pursue what you want to do and I just remember listening to songs from artists that talked about you know moving to the big city and like having big dreams and like you know wanting something more than just you know staying where you were born and hearing that from somebody really helped me push through not really feeling like I belonged anywhere so I think that's, that's just like one example of that, that sounds like now. your entire life motivation which and, and I'm sure to a lot of people, it, it does do things at different points in their lives. But to you, of course, as a professional musician, that's a really great place to take that question. Thanks for answering it like that, because yeah, it, it drives you to do well in your career. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. What do you guys want to talk? Have we talked about a funny story from the road? Oh, I don't think we have yet. Did we? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> she's so, been blushing <laughs> i know i'm trying to think of one now because i'm just thinking i feel like this is bring out some celebrity like if you want to ask me about any celebrity that i met i've embarrassed myself like i've done the worst things in front of famous people and i can Sounds like me <laughs> I, yeah right this like can you meet anybody of importance it's just like game over i can't but i don't know chill do you can you think of something because you you just said that you had stories. I don't do anything embarrassing. I mean, that's not true. I do, but like, <laughs> you know what? Not I, a, I usually, not to do. I usually tell good cop, Sean, bad cop here. I usually tell the Sean Mendes story, but I 
for the sake of this show, I think we should tell the Foo Fighters story because I think that's the best one. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay, so I'm this into the Foo Fighters story for sure. Okay, so yeah. the Sean Mendes one actually had to do with the Sean Mendes, and it was very embarrassing, and it happened on two separate occasions. But you can this- tell us both if you want. Oh, oh my gosh! Yeah. Okay, yeah. my battery's last. Let's do with this, because you have a little battery. Um, Okay, so Foo Fighters one. This one's really embarrassing and we'll probably lose a lot of cool points for this, but (laughs) we're just trying to be honest here. All right, his battery is dying. Okay, I'll be quick. So we were singing at um, festival, the Sundance Film Festival. This was like 2012? 13. 13? 12. 12, 13, 13. 13. It was definitely the 13. Around there. And... Anyway, the organizers of this event, it was like a gifting lounge for like people that were nominated for different films. So there were like celebrities coming in and out and we were like the entertainment for the gifting lounge. And there was word that uh, Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters was going to be in and hanging out. And like I was 12 or 13, maybe right? Yeah. Somewhere around there. And I wasn't one of those cool 12 or 13 year olds that like super knew like all of Nirvana and knew what everybody looked like. I knew who Dave Grohl was and I knew who, you know, those bands were, but I didn't necessarily know like their face and like what they look like. So I was, I was not as, um, what's the word? I wasn't as educated in that era of music and which is fine. You know, that's my most embarrassing part of the story was that I didn't know his face exactly. And anyway, so the PR people were like, oh my gosh, David Grohl's here, this and that. And I don't think they knew what he looked like, Sarah, to be honest, though. I don't think anybody I don't think knew. they knew what he looked like. And this guy comes in and I think I remember he's like wearing sunglasses and he's tall and he's wearing like the leather boots and stuff. So when you're 13, you don't really know what great Dave Grohl looks like. You like you think, oh my gosh, that's Dave Grohl, holy shit. And we're singing this and that, and he ends up coming up to us, and we talk to him, and he's like, hey, like, you should have me on Facebook, like, we should write sometime, um, because, like, we were performing, and he's a musician, and, like, we're thinking, oh, wow, like, we can write with Dave Grohl, this is crazy. And he gives us his name, and I'm not going to say the name, because I don't want to, like, out (laughs) but let's just say his name was David Cooper. Okay, random name, not his name. We're like David Cooper. Oh my gosh, he gave us like his fake name, like his fake Facebook. We got it. <laughs> we literally thought it was his private Facebook, his fake private Facebook, so that nobody knows it's Dave Cole. Okay. I kid you, I kid you not. That's anyway, what later out we found out that the other performer at the show was Daryl Hannah and Daryl Hannah's band player was in the Foo Fighters as of recently as like a backup player uh keys or something and anyway so it wasn't actually Dave Grohl and for years later once we found out that this guy was actually just like David Cooper quote unquote we were like we called him the Foo Faker It was funny. It was funny. Poor guy. But it wasn't his fault. It wasn't his fault. Like he his was just himself. He wasn't pretending to be Dave Grohl. It's just like no. everybody thought. I think everybody thought he was Dave Grohl. And he's a very <laughs> successful musician in his own right. Like he is very talented, very connected. Yeah, he actually yeah. is. Like we had looked his actual, like he's an actual, yeah, musician. Thanks for not using his real name, though. I would have had to use the bleep button for the first time in my career. So yeah, no, we're not gonna out him. Uh, you not- can say whatever you want. I caught the F bomb earlier. I think it was Charlotte. Oh, yeah. And Charlotte. that's okay. Oh, that's okay. Damn. If you're okay with it, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it, but I like I totally didn't even realize I said that. My Don't channel is not for kids. Charlotte. My brain was like, be a PG, whatever, you know? <laughs> <laughs> At least. PG okay. Tall. Yeah. So what else do you want to cover? It looks like we got some time. My battery's still kicking. So what do you use most now? Instagram. Probably Instagram. We're still trying to figure out TikTok. I think I'm too old. Um, <laughs> definitely Instagram, um, Facebook, Twitter, all that shit. Oh, yeah. I said another swear. 
<laughs> yeah, we have all, oh, I mean, we do have a website if you want to go to our website. in the jar. Yeah, we'll be on your website for sure. I'm, I'm, I share all those things in the description. Oh, who's got my t shirt? Is it at Goodwill yet? <laughs> no, we have it still. That's in Toronto. Show that's a okay. your apartment. Yeah, oh, we have yeah. that. I've actually worn it like probably a, a bajillion times and it's not at Goodwill. You wear my shirt? Oh my God. I wear it. It's there. Yes. <laughs> It's that. great quality, like it's very comfortable. Yeah. I like I like it you know. too. Toronto rocks, like um, and so okay, so there's another thing that you know I recently learned that something that I do, which is support young women in music, I do it a lot. I do it more than I do it for the guys. And I think it's more than just because I'm bored of looking at men on stage. And it's not just that I'm objectifying you by looking at, at girls. It's it's more. It's for one thing, your voices, when you guys harmonize, it really brings a tear to my eye. Honest. And and so that's something that guys don't do. Like not since the Eagles. Okay. So I you know, you know what I'm talking about? But yeah. but they do they do mention that there's a thing called so, um, spiritual bypassing. So yeah. if I'm just concentrating on the girls all the time, everybody thinks it's for the wrong reasons or I'm missing something. And I don't feel I'm missing something. I feel like it's harder for you guys to compete. And, you know, you're not given the same leeway or the same celebrity or like you got to fight tooth and nail for every for every listen. And so so without me getting too far into what it's like for girls in music, why don't you tell us? Yeah. Um, sorry, Shar, I feel like- Sarah, go ahead, you start, you start. No, like, uh, thank you, Billy, uh, so much for saying that. I realize it's Bill Z on here. Do I say Billy or Bill? Whatever you want, you know me. Okay, wh whatever. <laughs> um, it's so important for both men and women to care about gender equality in music because that's the only way it's going to get better is if both sides of the coin are like passionate about um, the struggles and stuff. Um, I'll never, for I mean, we've obviously like many women have experienced the variety of struggles of what it's like to be a female in the music industry, but I'll never forget like one particular uh, instance that's played in my head a million times or as the, the young people say it lives in my head rent free um, <laughs> it's always in my head um, we were at like a Canadian award show and um, almost all of the people that won these major awards said that the reason why they got th where they were today was because they had became buddies with these other really talented people and they usually met like in a basement at like 2 a.m. and they like bonded over beers and they like became fast friends and that friendship turned into collaboration which turned into business and as a woman that's been my biggest struggle is you know if I'm wanting to network or collaborate with a guy you know the second a guy finds you attractive um, and tries something or doesn't succeed or whatever goes down like all of a sudden that career that potential career partnership is kind of died um, and that's what I've seen that struggled for a lot for women. You know, if they're invited out at 2 a.m. to a basement, they may feel unsafe or they may not know that it's like a good place to be at 2 a.m. Um, so that's like the biggest struggle that I've, one of the struggles I've seen um, that I've tried to maintain that bro level with a lot of people in the industry but it's still something that, you know, we just need to include more women, whether that's like systematic change, like through organizations and through um, regulations um, to give women a chance to succeed. Yeah, I like, I'll say one really quick thing. I mean, I remember, Sarah, you'll of course remember, um, not that long ago, actually, maybe five years ago, six years ago, uh, we had a guy tell us, you know, as soon as you're boobs start sagging and you're 25 you're too old to sing pop music which is like oh. ridiculous this guy, yo, this guy and like had we should have outed him at the time because like nowadays like it's almost like encouraged to people that say really harmful things can't get away with it anymore mm -hmm. that, yeah. this was just before that and this guy is still very connected very respected within the canadian industry and the fact that he said that to us and i was what like 
17, 18, and you were like young. <laughs> like, oh. Yeah. No, it was it was insane. Um, it was. I mean, you look at people like Steve Vai. I wish I was one percent as cool as Steve Vai. Like mm -hmm. the fact that he's the way that he is. Um, no, but thank you so much for like taking the time to support us. I remember since we met you at the the beach house, like. We've just been in contact since then, and yeah, I, like, follow you. I was so excited when I found out that we got to do an interview with you, so. Oh. Uh. Yeah, no, absolutely. We, yeah, we hope that one day soon we can actually see people perform again and do more shows and uh, locally, you know, a lot, we'd love to play. There's so many places in Toronto, so. Yeah, to I need a full-scale Command Sister show. <laughs> uh, I have not had that. Yeah, I know. We, we, we had gotten one ready just before the, the pandemic hit, but uh, it's going to happen, yeah. though. It's going to happen. That's what we're waiting for here in Toronto. Yep. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah. We have that uh, at Instagram Live for that. Um, at 8 o'clock. Um, but I will, uh, some Instagram Live we're doing in like 10 minutes. I think it's like a pre-show thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. I'll say really quickly, though, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, thank you so much. So this is technically under Toronto Rocks, right? Musicians in bars getting beer is Toronto Rocks. Yeah, it's the same thing. Okay, There's two cool. different websites, though. Okay, awesome. Oh, yeah, thank you so much to Toronto Rocks and musicians. Oh, oh gosh, I need to do that again. Musicians <laughs> and musicians and getting you know, Sein you know Seinfeld? I know he's way too old for you, right? No, we love oh, Seinfeld. Love That's Seinfeld. okay. <laughs> No, my dad, yeah. my dad got me on it. He plays it all the time. And trust me, I love that show. Well, Seinfeld does a web series called Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee. Oh, oh yeah. okay, now and, I and I've never seen it, never heard of it. Uh, no, I ripped I, it off. It's on Netflix, I think, right? Yeah. Something like that, yeah. Right. Anyway, yeah. so I'm musicians in bars getting beer, but we're not in bars and nobody's got a beer. Right. Yeah. So yes, it's gonna happen. Okay. <laughs> now I feel like one you want to say people. it right? <laughs> yes, I want to say it right. Okay. Uh, okay. One, two, three, go. Uh, thank you so much, Shauna Rocks and musicians and bars getting beers for having us. We are so stoked. And if you guys want to check out our latest single, Rain on My Parade, it's out now on all platforms. If you guys want to follow us on social media at Command Sisters on everything to stay updated for our next release. Thank you so much. Is that okay? Awesome. Cheers. Thank you very much. You guys are the best. You know what? Good energy is really hard to find. It's really hard to find people that have good energy. So yeah, thank you.